morning, everybody, and uh, and uh, it's uh, certainly a great privilege uh, for me to uh, talk to you a little bit about our story. But um, before, hot off the press, 11th of November, 1995, McDonald's opened its first restaurant in Blackheath, McDonald's. Um, and I think yesterday, I was standing at the exact same restaurant, cutting the ribbon one more time. We bashed down the McDonald's restaurant. We've rebuilt it with all its sexy and modern and fancy gadgets and gizmos. But at the end of the day, it was around the Big Mac. It still contributes 20% of our total business. And in a humble way, we proved to ourselves that you don't have to come to this country in your first year to have long queues. You can be in McDonald's for 20 years, and those were the queues out of some of our restaurants yesterday of people just wanting to belong to this brand and people just wanting to taste their favorite burger, which is the Big Mac. A very humbling time for us and a very privileged time for me to cut the cake again in that center photograph with uh, Reggie Scosana, who uh, was the franchisee of our first McDonald's 20 years ago and is still our franchisee of that restaurant. He now has five restaurants. So I'd like to introduce you to two other franchisees, Diru, Sanjay, Nathu. Now these two are, are two franchisees in the KwaZulu-Natal market. But the moral of the story is not about Prakash and Sanjay. The moral of the story is actually about their father, Diru Nathu. You see, Diru was the third franchisee of McDonald's and the first franchisee in KwaZulu-Natal. This is also the busiest restaurant in the whole of South Africa, Old Fort Road McDonald's. Unfortunately, Diru is no longer with us and he played an instrumental part in my upbringing in McDonald's. There's no doubt that Diru Nathu was one of my very senior mentors and taught me to become a great franchisor. But he passed the business down to his two guys, two sons, and they have now built the empire from four restaurants to 10 restaurants, showing that for us, deep partnerships are much bigger than a contract that we sign with each other. They're long, enduring partnerships that have sustained from generation to generation that are beyond the contract. This is not about a partnership. This is about a family. So McDonald's uh, International uh, just did a press release yesterday at uh, 91 million customers every single day. So that statistic of 70 million customers every single day is a little outdated. And uh, we have just over 35,000 restaurants in 120 countries around the world. So uh, here in South Africa, as of uh, yesterday, we uh, had uh, 234 restaurants. As of uh, yesterday, 235 when we reopened Blackheath. As of this weekend, 236. As of the end of the year, we should have about 244. So we continue to grow this brand. Um, and I guess once uh, one person said to me, but is 200 in 20 years really successful? Would you declare that a success? And I've always said that, no, we don't want to be the biggest. We want to be the best. And we have uh, proud uh, McDonald's units that are sustainable, that are profitable for our franchisees. All right, so we serve 8 million customers every single month in the McDonald's business. And, uh, and that is not quite the 91 million customers that we serve around the world. But uh, I guess if we look at the... Uh, the amount of people that have jobs in this country at uh, 16 million, we're serving half of those every single month. So we spoke a little bit about uh, what the economy looks like. And, uh, and certainly we live in a changing environment. Uh, when your input costs are increasing at 5 to 6% per annum, and your GDP growth, as we saw with CISO, is only increasing at 1 or 2%, you pretty much have an unsustainable business model. And as business leaders and as franchisors, we need to look at this uh, e um, formula and say, how do we create value and profitability for our shareholders and our franchisees in our organization? The easy way, I guess, is to cut. And you can't cut yourself to victory. The more difficult way is to make sure that your top line revenue continues to outstrip inflation and continues to grow. Now, you can grow in many, many ways, but nine out of 10 times, it's us as business leaders that can't see the window of opportunity that lies amongst the gray cloud that sits on top of our head in this country at this point in time. 
And so it's not necessarily looking at, at uh, detailed reports. Sometimes it's taking an introspective on ourselves and our leadership teams and our management teams and saying, can we see the window of, of opportunity that everybody else can't? And the question we have to ask ourselves, are we the dinosaur in the room that can't take our business to the next level? So one of those solutions is innovation. A modern and contemporary business that's not growing is probably a modern and contemporary business that's not innovating. And so I talk about the upside down triangle. Because if every great idea comes from myself and the EXCO, we're probably gonna have one or two great ideas and my ideas aren't that great anyway. But if we cultivate a culture of innovation in our organizations where great ideas come from our people, where great ideas come from our franchisees, then every single month I just gotta just pull down our innovation platform and find 500 ideas. My job becomes easy. It's which idea to choose but if you're going to have an innovation culture, you better execute some of those best ideas. Otherwise, it won't be sustainable. The Egg McMuffin's a classic. That idea was born by a franchisee in, uh, in Dallas in, in the US. And hopefully in a humble way, again, not in an arrogant way, I can proudly say now, as it's our birthday that just happened, that not only have we lived history in the last 20 years, but I believe we've created history. For those of you that can remember 1995, we didn't really have drive through in this country, did we? I know it sounds crazy and probably arrogant for me to be able to say that, but we really didn't. We didn't have real, real drive through until McDonald's came to this country. And now drive through is part of our life. Everyone's got drive through And 12 and a half years ago, we decided to listen to that franchisee in downtown Dallas to be able to say, this is the way we're going to have breakfast. And if we brought that to South Africa, we probably would have said, Breakfast, two fried eggs, some toast, and some bacon, isn't it? That's the South African breakfast, isn't it? But we came up with the egg McMuffin, poached with a little bit of ketchup on it, and it's 11% of our total business. So innovation is listening to what your customers are saying, but innovation is also about being maverick. Who would have thought seven years ago that an idea came from uh, two of my franchisees, Mr. Peter Moyanga from Springs, and the late Ishmael Maloko from Bruma, and they said, let's go 24-7. I wasn't quite the CEO at that point in time, but I was head of operations, and I said, not in my lifetime are we going 24-7 in this country. It's volatile, it's hostile, people are not going to be around and about. Maybe I was showing my age that I wasn't around at 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning. But they took me to downtown Washington after a worldwide convention like this with our franchisees, and man, I was scared in downtown Washington. That was much worse than South Africa could ever be, no matter where you are. 74% of our total business trades 24-7, and it contributes 5.5% of our total revenue. The change overnight, however, it was not a franchise decision, it was a people decision. See, when you're in the food game, you word shifts. And when you, when you, when you, we all know from South Africa, most of our crew all right, have to travel long distances to get to the McDonald's. So when you're clocking off at 11 o'clock in the evening, You've got to take a taxi. By the time you wait for a taxi to get home after you've cleaned the restaurant, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. That's not a value proposition to your people. And so when we took the idea to our people, we said, how about this 24-hour concept? We thought commercially it makes sense. They thought from a people's perspective this was incredible. And that's what allows us to scale so quickly. And then uh, two last stories about innovation. Who would have thought that McDonald's would have espresso-based coffee? 80 cafes in the last five years we've put into the system. And I guess uh, about four or five weeks ago, I think in one of the major publications, we were voted the second coolest coffee brand in the country. I'm like saying, coffee brand? Are you guys crazy? When my marketing guy showed me this. But at the end of the day, we spend quite a lot of time to perfect that brand and understand it's not just about Big Macs. It's not just about French fries. We can sell coffee too and we can sell the best carrot cake in town. And then lastly, just eight months ago, we decided we're gonna go with delivery. McDonald's delivery, already 74 hubs in the last eight months scaled. Now on this particular initiative, we weren't first. But I said to my team, if you're not gonna be first, you better be best. And so we came up with a platform in the McDonald's delivery system that's integrated from a technology standpoint, from an IT standpoint, that's bar none, will deliver, no doubt, by far the best service. And from that perspective, you have to continue to innovate. 
And all of those ideas that I shared with you today are not my ideas, nor were, my, they, were, were they the predecessor's ideas. It came to an innovative culture, and that's what McDonald's has. The next message I want to send to you is about relationships. I see behind the speakers, F&B flashes this little triangular. We call it the three-legged stool. Without one leg, the stool falls down. Our franchisees, the corporation, and our suppliers. We talk about not necessarily in harmony of a relationship making everybody happy. We talk about a relationship that makes everybody equally happy. Now, there's a fundamental difference there. Making everybody happy will compromise one other party. Make every, everybody equally happy, all right, needs compromisation from all different parties for a win-win or what we would call a triple-win situation. So how deep are your relationships in your organisations? With our service providers, our beef supplier, we don't have a service level agreement. With our lettuce supplier, we don't have a service level agreement. We can terminate our agreements with our suppliers with 30 days notice. And they can terminate their agreements with us with 30 days notice. We have a fundamental culture and business relationship agreement. Why? Because we're not dependent on each other. We're interdependent on each other. Because there is no other beef supplier that could supply McDonald's with beef. That's how independent or dependent we become of each other. Strategic, open book, long-term, transparent relationships with our strategic partners is absolutely crucial. And what about our franchise relationships? We've just rewritten our first few franchisees to pursue beyond 20 years. Not a five-year, not a seven-year, not a 10-year. McDonald's thinks 20, 30-year relationships with our strategic partners. Now, obviously, there's KPIs, and we have to hold ourselves accountable. And you know what? People leave, come and go along the relationship. But that's how we have to manage our organization. It's the ethos of the business. It's the thinking of the business. It's the culture that we're injecting on how important strategic relationships are. Being a franchisor is not for sissies. It's a serious commitment. And being a franchisee has a huge accountability as well. So my question to you is how deep are your relationships with your franchisees? And how deep are your relationships with your suppliers? And if they're not, I think we've got some thinking to do. So I have the, the luxury and the blessing to be able to interview most franchisees that come into McDonald's. And we don't actually have a huge amount of franchisees because our franchisees are multi-restaurant owner operators. We have just over 40 franchisees, but I have the luxury to do the final interview. And when I ask after a coffee chat and I ask the franchisees a few questions on what's happening in the organization and what do they expect, I ask, what's your role? They normally come up with these three points. First, I want a proven system with great training and support. Our franchisees come from different walks of life. Some are accountants, some are lawyers. We've got one or two builders. We've got people that are fresh out of school. So that's why training is so important for us. We don't need a certain qualification. We need a certain aptitude to be able to, uh, to absorb the McDonald's way. What we do need is a customer-centric culture. That's all we do need. The second one, and I would be surprised if any of us in the room would disagree with this, is a fair return on investment where I can generate growth and I can generate wealth. And the last one is about pride. One of my best mates is a salesman. He earns, lots of, he earns more money than I did, that I do. And he tells me this. He says, if you want to be a great salesman, you've got to believe and be proud in the product that you sell. We're a hamburger business, for goodness sake. We sell good food. And if the people in the organization don't believe that, all right, we can't even get out of the starting blocks. But the interesting thing about this particular point is that where does this conversation evolve with me and my franchisees three years into the relationship? And that's why I put the slide up in front of them, because the conversation changes. The conversation changes to say, I didn't ask to be the marketing director, so why are you trying to run marketing? I didn't ask to become the supply chain director, so why are you getting involved in supply chain? I didn't ask to be the, 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 the treasury, so why are we making decisions on what we should hedge and what we shouldn't hedge? This is where the relationship gets cloudy. This is where I need to hold, or I do hold the franchisees accountable, and so I expect them to hold us accountable. We have a list of KPIs as a corporation that we have to deliver, and we have a list of KPIs for the franchisees we have to deliver. Just like every sports team, be it rugby, be it football, be it netball, we've got our strikers and we've got our defenders and we need to know our roles. Where that role becomes murky 
that's where it starts to get dangerous in a franchise or franchisee uh, relationship. And we need to hold ourselves accountable. And if my team is not delivering, the franchisees need to tell me and we need to make those changes or we need to even eradicate some of those positions if so be it. And likewise on the franchise size. So I'm very, very overtly um, uh, opinionated when it comes to this, but me and my franchisees talk about this quite a lot. The next message I want to send you, and it's quite a simple message, but it's quite complicated too. The question is, do you have a strategy? Do you have a real strategy? Do you have a strategy that can look five years from now, maybe even 10 years? Because we can put up charts and look at the spikes and, and, and troughs when we look at the economic review. Can we go through that and can we sustain that? As you as a franchisor, do you have that credit card that can hold your business in times of distress? We call it a variance account. All right, and then only come, come uh, when times are good, uh, protect your franchisees when times are bad. But that long-term strategy needs to be five years. For us, we're now looking 10 years on the 10-year horizon. And whilst we're sitting in an economy that is at an all-time low, an eight-year low when I looked at that graph uh, from CISWE, an eight-turn low on consumer confidence, all right, can you muddle through the clutter because you focused on what your strategy is? And you've built enough buffer in your organisation, all right, to brave out the tough times, to surf that wave. And so like a chess master, you need to have a contingency plan. No chess master plays one move. There's always three or four moves behind. You see, when you have your contingency plans in the wardrobe, they're ready to go on your strategic plan. When the economy or the competition deals you a blow, it's one phone call and you pull out contingency plan number one. That creates a nimbleness in a large organisation. That creates an ability for you to be able to change on the dime and be first to market, quick to market, or even disruptive if you have to be. Now, leadership needs to shape the way we play the game. And we as leaders in the organisation, all right, are the chess masters uh, on this slide. Now, I can talk about culture forever, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Because if leadership shapes the way we play the game, culture is who we are. Culture is why we do things. And sometimes we need to go back to the founder of our organisations to understand culture. Because as we grow larger organisations, all right, we forget who we are. We forget why we do things, all right? And we involve, we just get things done out. So strategy needs to have strategy, long-term leadership and culture. The next message I want, to, I want to share with you is something called build the base. As an engineer, I've studied many shapes and sizes, but nothing like the pyramids in Egypt. Why would our ancestors build a pyramid that looks like this at 45 degrees? Fundamentally, the larger your base, the higher your pyramid. The only way you could get your pyramid high is you had to build a larger base, because that was just the, the, the physics at that point in time. But as franchisors and franchisees, we have a few things that we have to juggle. The balance, the balance between acquisition, growth, or the balance between organic growth. The balance between uh, top line leven revenue growth or the balance between bottom line profit. The balance between loyalty and the balance between shareholder return. It used to be location, location, location. No longer is that true. It's now location, timing, location. So how big is your base? And how ready are you to take your organisation to market? Do you have your systems in place? Have you taken care of your talent in your organisation? Are you ready to launch to the next level? Are you moving into Africa before you've perfected South Africa? Are you leveraging all the systems in your organisations in order to create the most efficient business model and franchise structure in your business. These are the choices that we face. Your pyramid's your pyramid. All I can say to you is make sure you've got your base right and you've ticked those blocks and the foundation of your organisation is very robust and sound. I talk about something called the power of 10, capability. I've had the luxury to watch McDonald's South Africa over the, two, over the last 20 years and seen four managing directors before me, but more than that, I've had the luxury of watching McDonald's worldwide over the last 60 years. And whilst the brands remain constant, the CEOs have changed. And, I, and I've sort of found it where the CEOs have changed and I've mapped it out to what the stock exchange looks like and the share price, 
And I've did my little own exercise to come up with this concept. And fundamentally what I'm saying is when your business changes by the power of 10, there's a fundamental organizational change and leadership change that needs to happen in your organization. Every CEO that takes over from another CEO is there for a certain role. When uh, Ray Kroc founded this business as the founder, he founded it with a vision. He said, I can make milkshakes better and quicker than anyone else. I can make cheeseburgers better and quicker than anyone else. And that was cool until he got to 100 restaurants. And he knew very, very well before that he could never leverage this business beyond that because he didn't have the leadership and management capabilities to scale this business to a global brand. And Fred Turner took over the business and took it to a thousand restaurants. And then the rest's history, seven or eight CEOs have come after. Now we have Steve Easterbrook that's running the organization. A gentleman out of the UK with a marketing expert who's saying probably we've gone too operational, all right, and we need to come all the way full circle back to the vision of Ray Kroc, which is about the brand and it's about the customer. And so many of us in the room started off our businesses. And I know I may be poking my finger in your face a little bit to be able to say, can you take your business to 1,000? Can you take your business to 10,000? Are you, are you visionary enough as you've created your own brands all right, to understand you either change like the dinosaur to become that modern and contemporary CEO that needs to be growing through the chapters of the power of 10, or you need to find somebody else that can unlock that for you in your organization. So whether your business revenue went from, from, from 100,000 to a million, whether you took your staff complement from 10 to 100, whether you went from a, a million rand EBITDA to a billion rand EBITDA, we need to understand that a business needs to change over time. And that, as from a leadership perspective, needs to change over time as well. Now, I've also seen with, uh, with my own eyes leaders that have been CEOs, managing directors, partners, and shareholders for 35, 40 years. But they've had the ability to evolve. Not many of us have those same characteristics. Thank you. I want to tell you a story about a young lady by the name of Tandi. She approached me about five years ago and she said to me, McDonald's, the franchisor, please help me. I own one coffee shop in the West Rand. Um, can you help me franchise my restaurant? So I went down and I visited her and a great cappuccino, I must, I must great paninis. Um, took her in three years later, tried to help her as best as possible. She opened up another coffee shop. Um, Moral of the story, cut a long story short, she failed. And she's gone back to one coffee shop. Tandi, entrepreneur, barista par excellence, but didn't have the ability to duplicate what was in her mind and in her heart into a franchise model that could grow into a thousand. So you have to be able to tap that entrepreneurial spirit, that understanding of how we found our organizations but if we have to duplicate her, we probably could only get to 10. If we want to scale an organization like McDonald's, you have to inculcate the founder into a culture and put that through the entire organization. So we've got strategy and we've got culture and we've got all these glossy things that I'm talking about, but how do you inculcate that culture into your organization? And there's many things I can do, but the one thing I'll leave you today is focus. So in your organization, is there one thing? Not many things. Not a series of values, not a whole list of items. Is there one thing every one of your employees will know? Because that's the starting point. That's the seed of an organization, all right, that leverages system alignment. For McDonald's, it's Q, S, C, and V. Quality, service, cleanliness, and value. All 10,005 of us, 10,500 of our, our South African employees in McDonald's should know what QSC is. I don't necessarily expect them for them to know the entire business plan, but we need to know when we wake up in the morning, have we enriched our customers' lives with a high quality product? Have we attempted to give best service? Are our restaurants spotlessly clean? And everything we do in our business is around great value experience. And value is not cheap. Value is just a great value experience. So I guess my second question to you in the audience today is, so, so what is that single thing in your business? And does everyone in your organization know that? Because that brings system alignment, that brings focus, and that starts to take the culture and the vision of the founder of this business, all right, to the next level of scalability. The next is about the people. 
So I already told you we got just over 10,000 people. One of the most inspiring, this is Maggie, the hostess in Woodmead, um, the restaurant that I visit the, the most next to my house, and she just inspires me every single day. I took this about uh, two, three weeks ago. What inspires me around the business is our people. And if you are an employer of first choice like McDonald's, best company to work for multiple times uh, over the last couple of years, um, we know that we have many people. And I've always said to our uh, chief people officer, maybe we need to change our value proposition to the people to not a best employer, but maybe an educational institution. No matter what it is, what is your value proposition to your people? Because they're the frontline people that are dealing with our customers. They're delivering on the promise. We're making that promise, but they have to deliver on it. And there's one way that you want to, you want to eradicate brand trust in an organization is don't deliver on your promise. There's two things that influence our customers, trust and respect. We break down trust or we don't, or we don't have adequate respect with our customers, we'll not have influence over them and therefore we'll not be able to get them more often into our restaurants. But McDonald's still has about 15, 20% churn of people in our organization, which means we're hiring 2,000 people. Our new restaurants, 1,000, and our old restaurants, we are churning out 1,000 uh, of people, 2,000 new employees every single year coming in and out of McDonald's. Our average age of a McDonald's employee is 25 years old. So most of our employees come out of matric, or come out of first year, first year, second year university, they come into McDonald's. We want them to stay, but we also want them to go. And we want them to become future leaders of an organization. They become your future customers. They become your brand ambassadors. Don't worry about marketing so much. Your marketing sits here. It's your people. And if they can't market your business while they're employed, and if they can't market your business while they've left your organization, you again, going to have a problem with the sustainability of your future, the evolution of a business. Colin Messina started off on the 11th of November 1995 in Blackheath McDonald's as a front counter crew person earning seven rand fifty an hour. Through the McDonald's Hamburger University he's grown to be a business leader in our organization and now he's the regional manager of the whole of KwaZulu-Natal. 30 restaurants, 3,000 employees. Joanne DeVette, Started off in Mitchell's Plain, Western Cape, as a, as a manager trainee. Similar story to Colin, she's now the chief restaurant support officer, the number one lady second in charge in this business. These are rich stories, just like me, Colin's been here for 18 years, just like me, Joanne DeVette's been here for 17 years. People don't stay in businesses that long if they, if they have a career. People stay in businesses that long if they have a journey and a family um, to, to, to close out with. So I'll leave you with two messages before we open up to questions because we spoke about strategy and these big principles and, and relationships with franchisees. But this is Ray Kroc. He's passed since. And he said, luck is a dividend of sweat. The more you sweat, the luckier you get. This is a tough business out there. We're street fighters. And if we thought we as franchisees and franchisors that it sits around some magic marketing campaign or the next latest uh, food thing that we put onto our menu and all of those innovation things which we have to do anyway, it gets down to rolling up our sleeves, being there on a front counter on a Friday night when the, when the, when the drive through is pumping and, and knock it out. This is a hard working business. And for us, I expect the franchisees and I expect the corporation to get out there and apply it. And we'll create our own luck because we have to work very hard. Thank you. And my last message for you. Three years ago, we pushed out a management incentive to our restaurant managers. We thought maybe should we go for a 13th check? Should we go for a bonus? Let's be disruptive. Let's be innovative. No bonuses, no 13th check. You book yourself a trip on that ship. Well, it's not that ship, but you book yourself on a ship to Mauritius and back for six days if you hit these three KPIs. A top line sell revenue KPI, a people KPI, and a customer KPI. And at that time we had only 150 restaurants and 115 restaurant managers hit the three KPIs. So it was one of our best years. And I remember I was on the ship with them six days with a, with a bunch of 25 year old restaurant managers. It was quite hectic for me, but anyway, I survived it. No Wi-Fi, no connections, no nothing. I'm just sitting there, we're just partying and drinking a lot of beer. And I was standing behind the ship, not quite like the Titanic because it, it hasn't sunk, it didn't sink, it won't sink. 
And I was looking at the back of the ship and it was churning out this huge amount of water, just cranking along. And I thought to myself, how does a ship turn? Surely there's a guy with a steering wheel and he, he just hoys it left and right and the ship turns left and right, but it's like three, time, three, three soccer fields. And as soon as I got back into the station in Durban, I googled how does a ship turn? And obviously modern ships have got jets with jet engines and so you just boost it and it just moves from side to side. But an old ship turns with a rudder. But because the ship's so big, um, it has a little rudder in a rudder. That little rudder is called a trim tab. T-R-I-M-T-A-B. You see, when you turn the little rudder left, the big rudder turns right. And when the big rudder turns right, the ship turns left. Primitive form of power steering, I would say. So whilst as, as business owners, as franchisors, as franchisees, and we deal with strategic partnerships, we never, need, we never need to lose the sight of the small things that make the big difference every single day of our life. What have you done this morning? A thank you, a welcome, a telephone call to a customer that gave you feedback, a telephone call to a restaurant manager that gave superior service, a telephone call to a strategic partner of yours that has constantly produced fantastic value food products. It's the small things that count in our organization and that's what holds us together as a big brand. Thank you very much. Uh, Greg, thank you very much indeed. And uh, what we'd like to do is actually uh, spend a couple of minutes uh, um, picking your mind, because, uh, you know, the McDonald's story is quite remarkable, and as you said, very innovative over time, and has changed the game in many respects. Uh, as you said, particularly the drive through experience, that's one thing that I, I certainly saw. Although, on day one, we walked <laughs> for quite a bit in a queue just to get that first taste of that McDonald's burger 20 years ago. All right, so are there, are there any questions that you have that's been inspired by what Greg said and what he's shared? Uh, just raise your hand and uh, we'll get a microphone to you. Whilst they do that, maybe, I mean, you talk about 244 restaurants in South Africa by the end of the year. What about your presence across the continent? What's the story there? At this point in time, we're in South Africa and we're in Egypt. We have a small um, look and feel in Morocco. We don't have any immediate plans to go to Africa. Um, at this point in time, with the type of growth and focus that we have in South Africa, we want to maximize that first. Mm. There's no doubt we have a BDI on Africa. As I said with MDS, if you're not the first, you better be best. And uh, our delivery service. So um, for us, it's not about if, it's about when. Mm. But it's not next year. Okay. 150 million people in Nigeria. Absolutely. You can, get, uh, you can get it right or you cannot get it right. <laughs> so we want to make sure that when we go there, we get it right. Okay. Any questions? Because I can talk to him all day if I'm left to my own devices. One, one question, and I'm sure that you're grappling with and having to deal with, particularly in the fast food environment, consumers are constantly hearing messages about health. Uh, WHO this week talked about processed meats being dangerous. They even talked about cancer. How do you get growth five consecutive years and this kind of message continues to come through? And you've got to keep people believing, actually, as you said, that you're serving good food. Well, we can't run away from this, and I think that's 100% right. This, uh, the world is moving towards a, a more healthy way of eating, and there's a number of ways. The first, you've got to educate your consumer on what you're eating. Just because it's served um, in, a, in a Lani restaurant on a white tablecloth, mm. we have this perception that that's health. But really, when we strip down on how the chefs cook that and the oil and the shortening that they've done to make that beautiful fish look, look beautiful, mm. it's actually not as healthy as a quarter pounder. Mm. So the first thing that we have to do is... <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, the, so the first thing that we have to do is we need to change the perceptions that many of you have in the audience. We have to change the perceptions of, so what is in a quarter pounder? Because mm. people don't know. Mm. And so we've gone with a campaign called Know Your Food, and I can stand up as CEO and stand in front of you and say, Come to McDonald's and eat a quarter pounder. It's good for you. I only got one laugh there. <laughs> but, um, but that's not authentic, is it? Yeah. All right. So why don't we uh, change the conversation which we've done on our campaign and said it's not about what Greg says. It's about what, uh, what you observe. So come into our factory. Let's, uh, let's see how we, how we make our meat. Come into our restaurants. Let's see how we cook our food. 
And so we do about a thousand what we call open doors. I personally do about 40 open doors every single year where we go into our facilities and into our plants and we actually say, so this is how McDonald's is made. Check out that lettuce, check out the tomato. Let's have a look at how beef patty is mm. made. Because it's not about me telling the story. We know with modern ways and authenticity of messages, if your mate tells you or your mother tells you or your friend tells you, all right, that the food is good food, all right, then it's good food. With that said, mm. let's put that aside. The business needs to evolve, all right? And we talk about carb count on a, on a white bread bun versus carb count on a low GI bun. McDonald's will go there. It has to go there. Mm. When, you, when you're one of, if not the largest food producer in the world and serving so many hamburgers at that 61 million number, it's more than just a commercial thing. It's a responsibility. Mm. So McDonald's will continue their journey. We'll continue to, to listen to what our consumers is. It's about education. It's about giving consumers choice for them to choose what they want to eat. And it's about changing our menu according to what South African consumers want. Business can get really tough. Uh, we're not experiencing the uh, easiest economic environments. How do you motivate franchisees to, to plan for the future, particularly when we're in the midst of tough economic times? Well, this is a very, very tough time mm. for our franchisees, although the last six months have been, uh, once again, fantastic. The last five years have been fantastic. Mm. Uh, first six months of the year, last six months of last year have been very, very tough. Um, but for us, it's not about the bottom line, it's about the top line. There's a lot of fixed costs that sit in our profit and loss and income statement. When it comes through on the bottom line, we've got feet in our doors, it dribbles down and it comes down to, to, to bottom line profit. So uh, I think the best way that I can, I can't take the pain, we share risks as franchise or franchisees. Uh, the best thing that I can do with our franchisees is be completely transparent with them, have them completely involved in the strategic plan. Uh, we've just finished our planning process. It's culminated in three large franchise meetings from June all the way through. They have co-architected our plan. They know where we're going, all right? If you're going to walk into, uh, in, into the war zone, you want to know what you're walking into. Um, and I think they're very, very clear on what they're walking to so they can brace themselves for this tough time. Although, as I say, the last six months have been pretty good for us. I'm mean, expecting a fantastic November. I looked at November sales uh, uh, this morning. They, they're fantastic. It's sitting at double digit. November, uh, December, we've got a fantastic promotion coming through. However, I'm saying to them, hold tight for, for the Christmas and festive season because January, February and March are going to be mm. tough again. Okay, all right. If there are no other questions, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please put your hands together for Greg Sullivan, CEO of McDonald's South Africa.